Okay, uh, okay. welcome everybody to um, Tech It Out with Vista. Today is Friday, March 3rd, and um, today we're very pleased to um, in have John Tang with uh, Microsoft Research. He's a senior principal researcher with Microsoft Research. Um, and we I'll tell you a bit, little bit more about him. Um, wanted to let you know we're not going to mute everybody. You can mute yourself. Um, John's probably going to ask for some feedback so you can unmute yourself and respond or raise your hand. Um, to it, uh, it's on the phone. It's star six to um, unmute and mute, or it's the other way around, mute and unmute, and then star nine to raise your hand and lower your hand. Um, and want to let you know the upcoming Tech It Out with Vista on April 7th is Dragon Dictation. So um, again, it's always the first Friday of the month. Um, and I want to thank Ryan, uh, our AT specialist in San Jose for joining. And he is also a co-host and uh, Bob Geyer, who um, who arranges all this and, and also hosts these most of the time. Uh, he's not feeling well, he's here um, and we're um, all helping. And then Stacey Grijalva is the assistive technology manager in our Santa Cruz office. Um, so really happy to have them and all, all the clients and volunteers. Um, happy you're joining us. Um, Ryan or Stacey, did you want to say anything before I uh, introduce John? Uh, no, we're good. Okay. So uh, just let you know, again, John Tang is Senior Principal Researcher with Microsoft Research. Um, John will be discussing two current research topics are making video meetings accessible to people who are blind or with low vision. And um, I'll let him talk in depth about um, how spatial sound uh, will help um, and make distinctions uh, versus uh, mono audio. So um, with that said, John, I'm going to make you, uh, I'm gonna get, make you co-host and I'm also going to um, give you the largest spotlight. Ooh, <laughs> thank you. Um, and I'm going to share a screen. Okay. Which, uh, let's see, share sound. Stereo. Share. Um, so thanks, Lisa, for that introduction. As she said, I'm John Tom from Microsoft Research. And I'm going to be talking about um, two research projects I've been involved with in making video meetings accessible to people who are blind or low vision. Now, as we mentioned, uh, I'm going to try to do some stereo sound demos. I, not, I don't have a lot of experience doing this on Zoom, or especially if you're joining on the phone, but this will work best if you are perceiving stereo audio, either through speakers or through stereo headsets or earbuds. Um, I'm told that it's best not to use the microphone on the AirPods to use um, to get the stereo sign or to turn the mic off. But um, I'm going to try to do uh, a demo. You know, spatial audio is very hard to demo over Zoom or any video calling because almost all video calling is mono audio. It's actually one of the problems I want to address. I am trying to run Zoom in what's called stereo sound mode, which is supposed to share stereo audio to you if you can perceive it. So uh, it's best if you have a wired headset or earbuds, may not work on Bluetooth headsets, um, don't use a mic on AirPods. Uh, but if you can't hear spatial audio, I will give you a URL link that you can play on your own. So I hope that makes sense. And to, to try to test this, I'm going to play some sound and I'm going to vary it around spatially and see if you can hear that effect. I saw a hand raised momentarily. I don't know if... Yes, 
I was trying to get Lisa's attention to ask the people that are unmuted to please mute because there's background noise coming in. Yep, we can do that. I think the only person that's not muted is John Giddings. Right, it, it was Mona. But oh, it was then, Mona? She's muted now. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, thank you. Sorry. Okay, so just to review, um, hopefully you're in your stereo spatial sound setup. I'm gonna play a sound and I'm gonna move it around left and right. And I want you to tell me whether you're hearing that spatially, so. This is a video for you to test how your Talking. sound system handles spatial audio from YouTube. Since YouTube only supports spatial audio on right. VR videos, the video is technically 360, even though it's blurry. It if now. you're watching on a phone or VR device, you can look around with your device to hear the audio come from different directions. Um, on a computer, so yeah. you can click and drag. Okay, so um, Lisa, I could tell, heard it. Can I get a hands up of people who heard that spatially? Uh, I'm getting some physical hands up. Ryan, yes. Scared, Emmanuel, okay. yes. Okay. So yeah. Diane, yep. Okay, okay. So okay. some people are definitely hearing this. Um, let me know if if you're not hearing it again. I will share some uh, uh, URLs that you can play this on your own. Sorry. So uh, I am sharing slides, but uh, I'm not expecting you to be able to read them. But I'm using it mainly to help me get through this. Uh, Actually, John, oh, you're only sharing um, the sound. It sounds like I, we see you still. Hold on a second. Thank okay. you for letting me know about that. Share screen. Screen one, share sound, advanced audio. Oh, weird. Okay. Button now. Yes. Oh. There you go. Okay, well then let me make sure, let me do my test again though, because okay. I don't, uh, okay. This is a video for you to test how your sound system handles yeah. big right. audio yeah. from okay. YouTube. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're there. Right. Um, I don't need to tell you video meetings have become pervasive over the uh, pandemic, uh, for better or for worse. I think uh, this is a special challenge for people who are blind and low vision, and that's something that uh, we've been spending a lot of our research time trying to figure out how to make video calls accessible to everyone. People who are blind and low vision have special challenges, but it's also a challenge for people who are deaf, are hard of hearing and use sign language. Video calling messes up their relationship with their uh, sign language interpreter. And it's also created people problems for people who are neurodivergent in terms of their cognitive overload, processing all that visual information. But um, for this audience, I want to focus on accessibility challenges for people who are blind and low vision. And we're going to talk about two research topics, one spatial audio and two hybrid meetings where some people are joining together in the room physically and others are joining remotely. This creates um, special challenges for uh, accessibility. And I would encourage people to ask questions, raise their hand along the way if, I'm, if, uh, if anything comes up while I'm talking. Okay, so spatial audio, which you've already gotten a little teaser demo of, allows you to render audio into different spatial locations. You know, often audio is rendered to correlate with where it appears visually, especially on video games where, you know, the sound comes from, uh, you know, the enemy tr as it tracks across the screen. And so, Spatial audio is a very interesting and valuable cue, certainly a cue that we use in, um, re in physical space, so we can tell when people are coming up to us from our right or our left or from behind. And it should also be supported in our digital spaces, such as video calling. But as I'm sure most of you know, most commercial video calling is mono audio. That is, all the sound feels like it's coming from the center of the screen, and there's no distinction among the various people talking as being located in different places. Now, Apple's FaceTime spatial audio um, made the first attempt at trying to add spatial audio to a video call. It was introduced back in June of 2021. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, a couple years ago. And actually, I don't know if we can get a show of hands. Has anyone tried a 
FaceTime spatial audio call, you need to have more than two people. Or has anyone had that experience? I see at least one hand. Maybe, maybe that's it, Don. You're you're a pioneer here. Um, and do, uh, Stacy also raised her hand. Don, do you, can you just say it, how many people have you had that call with, and do you like that experience? I think he's still Don, waiting. you might need to unmute. Um, okay. Yeah. okay. There you go. Uh, my my next door neighbor is the executive vice president of analog products at Apple. And I get to try a lot of things. Nice. Uh, and it turns out the uh, earpods and everything supporting them comes under him. Nice. So I actually was part of a meeting of about 20 people, and it got confusing. Uh, they are trying to direct the sound so that you know that it's coming from somebody on your left and then somebody on your right. And I've got stereo speakers that are 10 feet apart, and it just it didn't work very well yeah yeah okay um that's definitely interesting to hear i i actually thought that facetime had a limit of 10 max and i think 20 people is a lot to try to distinguish in terms right. of position so okay. this I, I was think... this was the development team so what right. they put out to test and what goes out as a product can be two totally different worlds as you know right right so i do think uh, spatial audio digitally online probably works in the space of 10 folks to separate them which is i think why uh, the product version does has a limit but um definitely true that it has a limit in terms of being able to distinguish um stacy i don't know if you have your hand up to ask a question or just to indicate that you'd had experience with uh facetime spatial audio but if you have want to make a comment about that Oh, sorry. Um, it, no, it just, uh, I did do that with your students last summer. Um, yes. So um, there was three of us on, on the um, call and it, it worked well. I, yeah. I enjoyed it. Yes. Great. Okay. So. so I think that's great to hear those experiences. I think spatial audio does work better for small teams uh, uh, up to about 10. And, and you need to do something different for larger groups, but I think it's an interesting resource. Uh, so the graphic I'm showing actually shows how, what FaceTime does is they actually spread the audio quite different than the way it's shown on the iPhone screen. So it's not as if the sound is coming from where the visual image of the person is, they actually spread it across a wider audio field to take advantage of giving as much spatial distinction as possible. And they have to figure out how to make sure that that's not like confusing. Um, so, they, so they do some staggering on the screen to enable that to happen. Okay, so here's the demo where um, I wanted to try to show something. And hold on just a minute. I'm gonna try to paste this link into uh, the chat so that people who, need to have it can have access to it i'm not uh, sure the chat is enabled so oh is that something that could be changed or let me see it, or, it's people, the way it's set up do people access the chat is that something that um bob had set it up that way because it's hard sometimes to um it's been hard to manage in the past and I don't yeah. know if we can go back. Yeah, okay. John, for the reasons that you're even here today is one of the reasons why we don't use the chat because it becomes overwhelming yep, for yep, people. Yep. Yeah. Okay. 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 So um, sorry, uh, then I'm going to play a demo. Uh, for those of you hearing stereo audio, hope you'll get the sense of this. Uh, for those who are not, I can share this link. You can hear it afterwards. Mm -hmm. But you're basically going to hear uh, people talking in a meeting, and sometimes the audio will be spatialized, and sometimes it will be not. 
and they're trying to show the advantages of spatial audio. It's a two and a half minute clip. Uh, I don't know if we're going to hear all of it, but um, I'll start that playing now. I'm going to try to start it playing. All now. right. So, so the goal here is we want to try to see so this how is mono audio. Audio. everybody's sort of talking at the same time. So we have to pick something that, uh, you know, it's first. It's, yeah, it's going to get us all yeah. to, to say something. So how about like right. now? It's like, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, my idea is to say everybody's favorite music or favorite band. Right. right. How's that, does that sound? Right. I think that sounds that really good. That sounds yeah, good. Let's do that. Okay. We could do favorite yeah. food too, but maybe band. Ooh, let's food. Oh, food. 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 Food's yeah. a good let's idea. Do, let's, or, do, let's, let's do food. Food. Yeah. Uh, food item or like genre? Genre. Food genre. <laughs> food genre. That could be the same thing, okay. right? Yeah, right. Right. So this would be the okay. thing. Maybe. It's like in the you know DoorDash uh, recommendation. Recommendations mm. as far as okay. categories, mm. right? Categories. Yeah. yeah. Okay. On the count. I'm gonna blurt out three. <laughs> and two, you can only. You got to pick your favorite. Ready? Okay. okay. <laughs> One. Count three. Two. Three. Give me a sandwich. Did somebody say chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's a genre. That's like food. Okay. Uh, food so item or like genre? Genre. Food genre. <laughs> It could be the same thing. Okay. Right? Yeah, right. So this would be okay. maybe it's like in the, you know, DoorDash uh, recommendations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Categories, right? Categories. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. On the I'm going to blurt out three. Okay. <laughs> okay. You, know, you got to pick your favorite. Okay. 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 <laughs> One, Count three. two, three. Give me a good Italian. sandwich. Food. Did somebody say chocolate? Chocolate? <laughs> That's fair. That's a genre. That's legit. Yeah, that's that counts. Whole, okay. So uh, hopefully that gave you a sense of what spatial audio can do. That was a particularly challenging case where everyone speaks at the same time. But I hope you got a sense of being able to distinguish people and what they're saying based on where they were, their audio was spatially located. And I think that's the advantage of spatial audio in terms of video meetings. So, um, spatial audio for video calling. I think you can put each person's voice into a different horizontal location up to about 15 people. Now, we are generally better at distinguishing horizontal audio position than vertical position. So that's why the easiest or the most um, clear way of spatializing audio is along the horizontal axis. But what that means is that the spatial audio can sort of override or do something different than the grid visual layout. So if you're familiar with how video windows are, are presented in Zoom or in Teams, it tends to be a grid where there's maybe three or four rows of video windows. And, and so you have three or four to a row, and then you've got this um, overlapping structure. But if, if you put the audio where the video appeared on that grid, it'd be actually very hard to distinguish people are stacked up on top of each other. So in spatial audio, you tend to use a different arrangement of trying to maximize laying people out horizontally. And then this also gets tricky when the visual layout moves around. So again, in Zoom, if someone joins or someone leaves, that tends to shuffle the grid of video images. And it's very confusing when their audio shuffles to a new position um, and that can appear for no apparent reason if you're not able to see the grid changing. <clears throat> also, when people turn their video on or off, that tends to cause people's position in the grid to change. And that would also potentially cause their audio to change if you were laying it out exactly that way. So what I actually think is interesting about spatial audio is that it requires you to rethink a user experience design that up to now has been visual first. I mean, most uh, computer interfaces have been designed visually first and, and everything else comes after that. You know, it sort of comes from the name, a graphical user interface. It suggests that they're relying or, or maybe over relying on the visual channel. But in fact, in person, you know, in physical rooms, we experience meetings not only visually, but through spatialized sound. And I think it's really 
important or be beneficial to convey both visual and spatial sound audio in digital video calls, not only for accessibility reasons, but I think there are other benefits that come from that. Okay, so, so far I've talked about using spatial audio to represent the different people's voices in a call. There's also the opportunity to use spatial audio to represent um, different aspects or different features of a video call. And I want to talk about a project that was done in the class that I teach at Stanford on designing for accessibility. This is a team of four students, Fang Qing, Rei Ying, Xiao Hai, Liu, and Yu Chen Wang, that um, tried to use spatial audio to separate different features of video calling. So for example, there'd be the speaker's audio, the presenter who was giving a talk, but then there are notifications, things like someone raising their hand or someone joining or leaving a call. And then there's also text chat. Now I understand that many people who are blind or low vision kind of tend to suppress or, or don't pay attention to text chat because it's problematic because that is read out using a screen reader at the same time that someone's speaking. But we wanted, the students wanted to experiment with possibly enabling you to attend to set text chat if they spatially located it at a different place. So I'm going to try to run a demo. Um, I think Stacy might have heard this when she worked for the team last uh, year, but um, a demo that shows um, mono audio, which is what we currently experience today, versus a demo where the announcements are on the left spatially the speakers in the center, and the text chat is on the right. So I'm going to get out of this, and you're going to first hear everything together as mono. The routine for people with autism then also challenged. has been lowered. It's hard for them to maintain focus in work. You can wait to everyone. Rule has been raised. Where can I find you? Where can I find you? Where can I find you? They may have difficulty making friends as well. It's also a challenge to everyone hand has been lower. I am excited to be here with you guys and present about what has joined. Okay, so I, that probably was hard to make sense of, but there was a speaker talking and there were announcements about people's hands raising or hands being lowered. And there was a text chat about being excited to be here or, or questions going on. So now I'm going to spatialize it, I hope, um, so that those are in different locations and see if you can um, hear that better. Sensory overload. It's sometimes hard for them to take public transportation or drive in cities. Knowing these day-to-day -day challenges can help us better empathize with their situations. We can then think about techniques that alleviate certain burdens under these particular circumstances. Okay, so that still is a little bit hard, but but perhaps you were able to better focus on the presenter, um, and over time you might be able to decide to listen to the hand raised notifications or the text chat. And of course, you could still decide to turn on or off any of these features. But I just wanted to give a sense of the potential of spatial audio, not only for um, the speakers, but for other uh, features or, or um, features in video calling. So, uh, I wanted to sort of summarize that our studies in spatial audio and video calling have demonstrated the advantages of spatialized audio. Um, it makes it easier to identify who said what. So you have an easier way to correlate who is giving these opinions because they're separated. Um, people preferred it, uh, that people saying that, that that was easier to participate in. And we think it also could reduce the cognitive effort that you need to pay attention in the video call. The so-called Zoom fatigue, although we don't call that in Microsoft, we don't say it's Zoom fatigue, but the video calling fatigue uh, of trying to pay attention when all the audio is mono, you're, you're spending more brain power associating the, the voice of what's talking with the person who's saying it compared to when it's spatially separated and people, you can kind of more easily distinguish who's saying what. And I want to point out that these benefits go beyond 
uh, benefits for people who are blind or low vision, but have universal design benefits. So Zoom fatigue is certainly one of them, but also, you know, people who are joining video calls from a mobile device uh, and therefore have a very small window to look at the screen and may not be able to see everything. Um, people who are joining video calls, uh, that's a misspelling, sorry, video calls while your eyes are busy. Uh, I happen to work in a team where uh, one of our managers joins a lot of video calls while she's driving and uh, she is able to participate, but not by looking at the video call. Um, and so it'd be important to give her kind of access to the things that we're seeing visually, even though her eyes are busy. And a recent uh, exploration is on verbal translation services. So, you know, in situations where you're trans, where someone is being translated to another language um, and there's a translator that is kind of giving that translation off it, today in video calls, that's all mono and it kind of overlaps and it's harder to distinguish. But if you could put the translator's voice in a separate audio location than the person speaking, that can be easier to pay attention to the translation while it's going do on. You, do you notify everybody when she's driving and on a call? It is clear from the interface. I mean, first of all, we get this um, awkward view of her uh, and there's usually a portion of the steering wheel involved. And yes, actually, I think that's an important point because because I know she's driving, I have a model of what she can and can't see. And I will maybe be more explicit about something that I think she might not be able to see. For example, that someone has their hand up to ask a question. She often isn't aware of that on, on the mobile interface while she's driving. So we'll say, hey, looks like Tony has a question. Um, so I do think it's important to share that information. Yeah. I think it's important for the cars around her to know that she's on a <laughs> video call. Yes, that's a good point. Um, we have made this point to her uh, at times, but I, I'm sorry to say this is uh, this is the signs of the times that we're in, especially here in Silicon Valley. Um, I, I think just people can't get away from it. Have a serious question. Have you considered the uh, putting the smaller uh, screens the, that show all of the people that are on the call in so that they're on the screen the same way they're being distributed by uh, the stereo? Right, right. So, I mean, I think that's ideal, but what happens is that you run out of space on the visual layout. So most video calls today use a sort of a stacked grid because they want to maximize um, showing as much of the each person's video as possible. And that, based on the screens that we currently use, ends up with like a, a matrix of three by three stacked on top of each other. But ideally, if you can I think what I would prefer is a sort of a staggered arrangement so that um, maybe it's not a, a packed grid, but but people start, uh, it's a little hard to describe, but, you know, they're not stacked directly on top of each other, but they're staggered in a little bit of a way so that you have a sense of a relative left to right position, both visually and um, auditorially. Okay. I'm not familiar with Microsoft's video product uh, or uh, video conferencing product. With Zoom, one of the displays you can get is the people are across the top of the screen. They're not stacked. They, And if you could have the speaker in the middle and then yep. the people spatially shown, I don't mean distance spatially, but the people that are coming across as being on the left side sound-wise being closest and furthest away across there. I think that would make it easier to understand. I, I think what you're, I'm low vision, and I think what my eyes see and my ears here get integrated. They, they do get integrated. And so I agree with you that ideally you should do something that I would say corresponds, if not exactly mirrors. And so, I think 
what would be best is a layout that visually had a sense of left to right that mapped with the audio. Although in the audio space, you can exaggerate the, the separation beyond what you're seeing visually. Right. I will point out though, that our brains, they do integrate audio and visual, but in a bit of a funny way. And the best example of this is ventriloquism, right? So ventriloquism relies on the fact that you sort, your brain sort of snaps to where it sees visual, but, but it can a little bit override what's happening in reality. And I think we can take advantage of that to kind of bend, uh, you know, go beyond what's literally physically visual to create an, a, an illusion or an effect that spreads people out more broadly and makes it easier to distinguish across things. Interesting. Yeah, this is this is cool research actually to to see. Basically, we're trying to figure out how much can we depart from physical kind of preciseness to give people a a. a uh, a comfortable experience while not kind of raising some conflict, some cognitive dissonance as they're experiencing it. Okay, uh, actually, I did want to invite anyone else to have any questions on spatial audio, um, share about any experiences they've had in spatial audio on video calling or, or any other thoughts about that. I, I do think this is coming along, um, you know, Apple started this off, this spatial audio and FaceTime, but I'm a little sad to say that I haven't come across many people that have taken advantage of it. And so it's a little bit slow to, to in educate or, or inform people how to um, take advantage of the spatial audio, even once we inv invite it into, once we offer it in the products. I'm actually glad to see that stereo audio in Zoom is working as well as it is in this talk. Um, but it's currently takes a bit of effort to make sure that happens. My hope is that spatial audio will become kind of a uh, just a default part of video calling in the not too distant future in commercial products. And we're kind of making baby steps toward that direction. Um, but I think we still have a long ways to go. Yeah, does anybody have any questions? If you do, you raise your hand um, or you, Stacy, go ahead. Hi, John. This is Bev here. This is Oh, hang on. Bev, Stacy yeah. Stacy's asking a question and then um and then uh you can go and then Emmanuel. Sorry. Um so I know when I worked with your students, I had to try a couple different um earbuds that I yeah. had. Yeah. Um so for for the audience to understand is that um if you're using earbuds um, on a, a device, um, it needs to be um, in stereo earbuds, correct? Correct. And actually, Stacy, that raises a question. Right now, um, Bluetooth uh, headsets in particular are a problem because um, we don't have a great industry standard that allows spatial audio and video calling to reach Bluetooth headsets. That was um, our problem last summer. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so I had is, to go around and find some other ones. Yeah. Yes, right. So so the, that's why I was recommending wired headsets as the best or speakers as mm -hmm. non as also are good. The problem, it's, it's a really embarrassing industry problem that Bluetooth headsets, they've defined a standard that works for music for for YouTube videos or things like that, but not for video calling. Um, and that's gonna be a longer process, uh, but but that is just sort of a weird technical uh, speed bump at the moment. Yeah, I just wanted people to understand so that they just like, oh, this, this what they're researching isn't, isn't good or it doesn't work well. Because once I did find the earphones that I thought it was amazing. I was like, I told your students, I said, when is this going to be on the market? Because <laughs> we need this right away. <laughs> but thank right. you. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I will point out, so Apple Air AirPods are different because Apple gets to control their entire uh, kind of hardware to software thing. It, it, so it does work on Air AirPods to an extent, 
but currently um, wired <coughs> stereo headsets are the best way to experience spatial audio. Great. Uh, Emmanuel, did you have your hand is up? You want to unmute yourself? Thank you. Yes, I just want to know if um, Mr. John had um, in the future working with uh, visually impaired with hard of hearing like myself, I use a bone conduction on my other ear. And that's a Bluetooth part. And some that I people I know have cochlear implants. Will that be somewhere in, in the future, Mr. John? Mm. That's a great question. I, I, I don't have any insight onto that, but I do think that would be um, technically that would be an interesting direction to explore. You know, it, it involves again working through some standardization issues, um, but it, but it, I don't think there's anything. Uh, what I want to say is that <clears throat> technically it can be done. Uh, as an industry, we'd have to kind of figure out all the, the right connections to make that happen. But I, but I think that could be done in the future. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Bev. Did you have a question? Does anyone else have a question, comment? Um. Go ahead, Beth. Um, I just wanted to ask if John could send a link to Lisa mm -hmm. so that we could go and try this out later. Sure. Um, I mean, I'll send a link send to that demo uh, to. Uh, uh, you can I'm send it to you can send it to Bob or Bob. whoever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and then he can. Yeah. Send that out. Thank you. I agree. This is Lisa. Um, we host Zoom meetings almost every day <laughs> um, and some hybrid. So this is, I think, at least from what I heard, this is very beneficial. We do get a lot of people who have uh, screen readers and, and and such. And I think that would, I don't know about you, but everybody who, who hears what's going on uh, with the cues, <laughs> the audio cues, I think it you know, it would be tremendous. So I either I could work with Stacy or somebody, I would love to be able to do this, you know, in all of our future meetings. Yeah. And I don't know if you have experimented using stereo sound in Zoom. I have not. And I could step you through or send you a link to it's not easy, I have to say. Okay. Um, but but um but I think that's it's a very interesting, powerful kind of step in that direction. I'm willing to make the investment. So um, uh, I work with, with, with Stacy and you and um, I'd be thrilled to do this. And I don't know if I, we get some nods or hands up here, um, but. Yeah, I'll, I'll send both of those things over. Okay. And I'll, I'll do my best to, yeah, make sure that Bob uh, or Stacy gets you my contact information. Cool, cool. Okay. okay. So now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the um, accessibility of hybrid meetings where some people are gathering together in a meeting room and others are joining remotely. Um, this is work that was done by a summer intern last summer, Rahaf Al-Harbi from the University of, University of Michigan, where um, <clears throat> she did a study of uh, hybrid meetings along with um, me serving as a mentor, Carl Henderson, another mentor from the product team, Sean Rintel and Sean Gilmore. Um, basically, we looked at um, what has been happening to meetings over the past few years, especially during the pandemic. So prior to the pandemic, um, people were familiar with gathering in a, in a meeting room or conference room around the table, everyone could see and hear each other uh, spatially. But during the pandemic, we shifted to a fully remote situation where individual people were sitting in front of their computer or, or mobile device, joining a meeting with other people. And now, as offices have reopened, we are experiencing what's usually called hybrid meetings, where some people are together in a meeting room, other people are joining remotely and they're represented on a video calling user experience, um, typically by a grid of video windows. 
Now, um, uh, at the time of this research, 74% of companies mentioned that they were planning to implement a permanent hybrid work model, having you know been forced into this situation because of the pandemic, but people are recognizing, hey, I like being able to be more flexible about when I work from home or when I go into the office. And so therefore meetings have to adjust to a notion that we are going to have a hybrid meeting experience uh, more in the future. Now, there are lots of pluses and minuses of hybrid meetings. Um, some research has shown that hybrid meetings increase work for productivity and well-being. It encourages um, exploring new avenues for creative collaboration. Um, it's certainly better for our environment if people are not stuck in traffic, commuting to places to have their meeting. But it also has problems. Um, hybrid meetings have technical breakdowns, uh, not only audio, uh, not only internet connectivity, but audio quality. Uh, I think many people are experiencing the fact that, you know, the microphones in these meeting rooms don't pick up sound from everyone equally. And so if you're not sitting close to a microphone, it might be harder to be heard. And there's a lot of attention paid to the asymmetry between being in person and being remote. I mean, the research shows that typically the people in the room form a bit of an in-group and more of the interaction or discussion happens within the meeting room and the remote people are often kind of forgot about or relegated to second-class citizens and don't get to participate as often. And so we wanted to understand better what people's experiences were with um, hybrid meetings, especially people with disabilities. And so Rahaf did a study where she interviewed uh, people that had regularly um, involvement that were regularly involved in hybrid meetings. We wanted to understand, of course, how to improve the experience of our product, Microsoft Teams, uh, but especially for those of uh, users with disabilities when they were attending hybrid meetings. And so we focus on people who are blind and low vision, deaf and hard of hearing, or neurodivergent professionals. Um, this did not necessarily include people who have mobility or dexterity issues. Uh, and I'm, I'm focusing on the subset of responses from people who are blind and low vision. So there were nine folks that identified as being blind or low vision out of, I think, uh, 30 or so total people that were interviewed. Three folks were totally blind screen reader users. Six folks used magnification. Um, seven primarily used Microsoft Teams for work. Uh, a lot of the people we interviewed were people that work at Microsoft. And two people use Zoom. I realize in the real world, probably the proportion of people use Zoom is much, much higher. So um, one issue that came up very strongly is the inaccessibility of shared content. So people said they really liked all the features that were available in video calling, yet they um, had problems with losing their at-home setup and when they moved back into meeting in the in the office. So if you're in a hybrid meeting in the in the room, you lost the fact that you'd set up a large display at home to make it easier to see um, or had other assistive devices. And other people even said that um, if they had to go into a hybrid meeting in person and they brought a large screen or um, or using magnification, they experienced a sense of stigma when other people saw them using this assistive technology in person. Whereas when everyone was joining remotely, no one was aware of what assistive technology or accommodations you were using on your screen. And so that's that became an issue in hybrid meetings. Um, the other thing they commented on was that there was a lack of visual description when others were presenting content, when they were sharing their screen. Um, so even though I'm sharing slides right now, I'm mostly talking about everything that's on the slides, um, but that didn't often happen. So uh, this is a bit of a repeat, but 
I'm going to focus on these five findings. Losing your at-home setup, facing stigma when using assistive technologies in person, um, lower awareness of people in the room when you're remote, or lower awareness of the remote people when you're in the room, and a lack of visual description when others are presenting content. So, <clears throat> at losing the at-home setup. People talked about during the pandemic buying really large monitors that afford magnification and then allowed you to track what was going on um, in a meeting without drawing undue attention. And so when they moved to hybrid meetings and they joined a meeting in person, um, they talked about the dilemma of what to do with that equipment. There's this one quote here that says, you know, I have a lot of equipment. I have a friend that jokes about the amount of stuff that I bring. So I have a large 17 inch laptop and I have this stand for the laptop that raises it so I can see it as well as a mouse. And, and this is what it took to make a meeting accessible to this person. And if he was attending the meeting in person, he brought all that in, but then it became a bit conspicuous to the other participants in the meeting. And although he was able to joke about it, there was some sense that there was a bit of stigma uh, associated with that. Now, some people would deal with this by attending a meeting in person, but also joining the meeting on their mobile phone. And then they could magnify on their mobile phone by pinching and zooming and, and making the shared content large enough to see. So that uh, that's one way in which you could kind of be in person in a hybrid meeting, but, um, uh, but uh, still get the benefits of magnification. But even that raised some potential areas for stigma. So uh, one of the people we talked to, the person who joined on the phone to magnify their content discovered that using phones in meetings could be interpreted as rude. So she relates this comment, you know, she did this in a meeting and someone made a wonderfully horrible comments about how it would be great if everyone was paying attention and staying off their phones. Um, but she was on the phone for accessibility reasons and she said, you know, I don't want to interrupt a meeting and be like, hey, I'm not being rude. You're being in inaccessible to me right now. So like you're failing, not me. Um, so she didn't say that. But of course, that was the sort of the tension she was feeling by being called out as being rude by looking at their phone, with, whereas that's an accessibility technique she was using. And another person talked about needing to explain that they're using their laptop in a meeting. So I tell the presenter in the room, hey, I'm going to look at my screen because I can't see what's on the projector. I'm going to zoom in on mine. I'm going to listen and I'm going to engage. I'm going to be an active participant but it's going to look like I'm not. Um, so this was a participant who was legally blind, um, but uh, did rely on uh, magnification and just felt like he needed to explain that so that people didn't think he wasn't paying attention. Okay, the second issue is lower awareness of people in the room when they're remote. So if you've joined a hybrid meeting and um, you know, you, for every remote person, you see one person per video frame. But for the room, you see a video camera of a meeting room and there might be five people or so within frame. And, and those five people are, of course, much smaller than the, the individual person framed in a video room. And so it's hard to see the images of people in the room. And it's hard to maintain awareness of them. And also, unlike, uh, you know, when people join or leave individually in Zoom, there's no announcements of people coming into the room or leaving. And so you have less awareness of people joining into the room because you can't see as easily, and there are no announcements about that. Similarly, there's lower awareness of the remote people when you're meeting in the room. So um, there's this question about, if you're in the room and you can't see, for example, those little name labels underneath each video window, you can't tell who's participating remotely. So there's a quote, I don't know what is going on with the remote participants. I know who's in the room. I know when they're coming, when they're leaving, when they're paying attention, when they're not paying attention, when they're involved or not involved. But with the room and with the remote people, I have absolutely no idea what's going on. This is 
uh, P17 was blind. So, uh, and we even heard comments that, you know, people would start talking to a remote person not knowing that that person had left the Zoom call, the video call, because uh, in the room, there's not that sense of awareness of people coming and going. Again, um, using a mobile client to join the meeting uh, could give you some of that information that the, that the video call program tells you, but that's problematic because if you join using your mobile phone, you've got to make sure to mute yourself or mute the speaker, which is a nuisance. Um, and so the observation is that you lose access to all the personal access tools when you physically go into the room meeting. I, I, perhaps I'm only telling you things that you're all, all too painfully aware of based on your own experiences, but it was really interesting to sort of catalog these from a research point of view and especially to figure out what things we could do to um, accommodate or to, to change the design. Uh, the other problem was lack of visual description when others are presenting shared content. Um, what we talked about earlier, it's hard to listen to the screen reader description of the slides while the presenter is talking. And so people often requested slides in advance to review before the meeting, but that of course took more time. Uh, one workaround is to use different devices for the screen reader in the meeting. And so some people may uh, kind of join with their phone and use their earbud to uh, deal with the voiceover, the, the screen reading, while listening to what's going on with the other ear. Um, otherwise, there were simple comments about requesting the pre presenter to verbally describe the slides. Okay, so uh, actually, uh, I'll give you some a chance to hear about more issues, but um, I wanna talk about some potential solutions that we came up from this work. Um, first of all, we, we did want to point out that hybrid meetings are an access enabler. Some people liked having the choice to attend either in person or attend remotely, and that allowed them to participate in meetings remotely, for example, that they would, would be too much of a hardship to join in person, or if they were in person to, to have the interactions that they wanted with people in the room, um, they still wanted to have access to people who were joining remotely. So we do see hybrid meetings as something that increases, can increase accessibility of meetings. Um, and, and therefore we encourage people or companies to continue to offer hybrid meetings. It is important to explicitly check in on the accessibility of meetings. So uh, routinely ask, you know, if there are ways in which, or there are obstacles to uh, participating in meeting, meeting and making sure that you address those obstacles. Um, it's important to announce names when speaking uh, in hybrid meetings, especially. Spatialized audio, I think, could help in, in hybrid meetings, especially the awareness of people who are joining remotely. Um, and the spatialized audio or screen reading of other elements in hybrid meetings, as we demonstrated, you know, if you could put the description, the verbal screen reading description of the shared content in one location that's different from the sounds of the speakers that would help you separate that. And we also heard people saying that uh, they might be interested in avatars to represent people who turn off their video. Um, this might be something I'd like to get feedback on, but uh, you know, people turn off their video for lots of reasons. Uh, they could be, you know, multitasking, or uh, they could be busy driving, um, or we, we have heard people who are blind or low vision tend to turn off their screens because their video cameras because they don't want to share visual information that they may not be aware of. But it seems like when you turn off your video camera in video calls, again, you get sort of represented to be a second class citizen, either you get represented by your name or if you chose a kind of static um, profile picture, then that shows up. But uh, we're beginning to explore these avatars, these sort of cartoon animated representations of people that can't even be designed to look like you, to resemble you physically. Um, and then that representation might be a more active representation. So if you turn off your video camera, your avatar shows up, 
it still does some sort of like idle movements. It, it, it blinks occasionally. It gives a sense of participating. And then when you do talk, the, the mouth of the avatar moves in concert with what you're saying. And so it's an attempt to provide a more active participation in the meeting, even though you're visually not sending your video signal. Um, so that's an area of research that we've been exploring and others. And I might uh, be curious to get people's uh, feedback on that. Yeah, so in fact, uh, I wanted to open it up now to allow people to talk about what their experiences have been in terms of accessibility problems while joining a hybrid video meeting um, or even a remote video meeting uh, or and any thoughts you have about maybe using an avatar to represent you uh, when you're not showing your video camera. Okay, Miriam. You have your hand up. Go ahead and unmute. Miriam? All right. There, there, there yep. I am. Okay. okay. Um, so you just hit an issue with me when you talked about reasons that people turn off the uh, the video on their on their when they're joining a meeting. Mm -hmm. And I just say, I think the avatar idea sounds very, very interesting. I, um, the only reason that I turn off my video is because I have to have my face so close to the screen to be able to right. see what's on the screen right. and or to be able to mute myself, to unmute myself, to raise my hand, to interact in any way. And that doesn't work with um, a camera taking a picture of me when right. my face is right there against the screen. Okay. So right. I just turn it off because it's the only thing that makes sense. Yep. So yeah, but the avatar yeah. I think sounds very interesting. Yeah, yeah. thanks for sharing that. I'm, it, I, this came up in an earlier study. Uh, someone, I think the comment was like, you know, a video camera captures my forehead because I'm looking so closely at my screen. And that of course presents another, you know, unexpected if not, Sort of stigmatized view, um, and so the the ability for avatars to give a a, um, a a representation of someone who's attentive, paying attention to the call, uh, participating, and even you know uh, moving the, the mouth as you talk to, to give that sense of participation is an area of um, interesting research for uh, high tech in general. You know, even avatars are also being used in virtual reality presentations because when you're being a, when you're wearing a VR headset no one can see your eyes and so forth and so they're trying to again figure out how to pr provide a representation that shows people involved in a conversation not people kind of embedded in some technology but yeah that's definitely an area of interest for us on research thanks Mary um, Stacy Go ahead and unmute. There you go. Hi. Um, so, yeah, the same thing um, for me. The majority of the time, I'm using an iPad or an iPhone um, to zoom in just to be more mobile. And um, instead of sitting at a desk, and, um, you know, I, we don't know unless we have, you know, the phone or the iPad set up on something. Um, and if I'm going to do that, I might as well be sitting at the desk and just on the computer. Um, you know, where the cameras, am I showing my nostrils? Is it mm -hmm. looking down my shirt? Mm -hmm. You know, all those types of things. So it's easier to have the the video off. And um, and I love the avatar. I, I know on an Apple phone, we can make an avatar. I just didn't know how to get it over into Zoom. Right. Um, so, uh, Zoom, let me see if I can find this really quickly. Because uh, I would love to, you know, um, have my avatar yeah. do all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So, at the risk of sounding like an advertisement for Microsoft Teams, we actually do allow you to replace your image with an avatar. And it is driven currently, um, our avatars are 
voice driven. So whenever it hears an audio signal, it will sort of puppet the mouth to move mm. along with it. Um, there are avatars along coming in the pike where they use the video camera to drive an avatar, but they don't share the video camera. Now, that may not work necessarily, uh, for example, if, if the camera that you're um, it captures an unflattering or not not a complete view of you. But there, are, I'll just say there is research on using the camera signal to animate an avatar. So if you raise your hand, the avatar's hand would raise because it sees that in the camera and can reflect that in the avatar. I, I will say, you know, one way to deal with the uh, you're so close to the camera that doesn't give you a good view is that you can choose to plug in another web camera into your laptop and capture kind of a, a more um, reasonable view. It's extra work um, and there are some focusing problems, but but that's another possibility. But I think I think we're about to see some innovations along this line. There is um, there was a startup company that had uh, sort of avatars. Uh, gosh, I'm not I'm not sure if I'm going to remember the name of it in time, but um, so there there are companies playing around with these ideas that um, allow you allow a camera to sort of power an avatar in your place. So we do use Teams at Vista uh, as an organization. Um, so currently we could create an avatar and, and use it in Teams. Um, okay, so now I'm going to have to, uh, that is true in the version of Teams that I use, but I use a, uh, an internal dev cycle, um, which means that it's not, I'm not sure. Fully released or something yeah. yet. So, uh, okay. I'll look into that, but it's certainly coming in, in the pike where you can choose, I mean, the way to look, to search in Teams for, it's called effects and avatars. So there's the blur background effect, which you may be familiar with, um, mm -hmm. but avatar is in that um, realm of Have, features. That, okay, in that uh, category. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Well, 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 we'll play around with that. Thank you, John. Sure. Any other questions? Any other questions or comments? Doesn't look like it. Excuse me. Let me do a quick search to see where we are about teams. Oh, yes, it's still. Seems to be in, huh, I'm a little unclear. There, there's some comments that say that it's in private pre preview. Others say that maybe in October we release avatars in the app store. So um, so try it out. I'll, I'll, I'll try to dig deeper and, and in this update, I'm gonna extend with Lisa. I'll, I'll try to share that as well. Cool. Well, I think that was, um, yeah, that was what I wanted to share uh, with the group. Uh, I really appreciate the feedback and input that you gave on the issues that I mentioned. Though it looks like Beverly has yeah. a question. Go ahead, Beverly. Bev, just unmute yourself. I okay, don't know if you, okay, here I am. I don't yeah. know if you'd be willing to do this, but I think I just found some stereo headphones. <laughs> I'm wondering if you'd be willing to play one of those links again. Sure, I think I could do that. Um, let's see. I okay. think these are stereo. I'll get back to them. Share screen again. Slide stopped. Share screen. Advanced stereo. There we go. And um, so here's the demo. This is a video for you to test how your sound system handles spatial audio from YouTube. I'm 
Since YouTube the only supports right. spatial audio on VR videos, the video is technically 360, even though it's now blank. It. If you're watching on a phone or VR device, left. you can look around with your device to hear the audio come from different directions. On oh. a computer, you can click and drag the video to look around. As you do session. so, you should hear my voice. I don't know if that uh, proved that you have stereo headphones yet, Bethany? Well, it didn't seem to work for that, but it works when I play music. Yes, so this is a common problem, and, and this has... Well, are those Bluetooth headsets? No, it's a wired one. Weird. Um, this this has something to do with the way uh, video calling programs interact with with some headsets. So things that work for music or video games may not work for video calling. Currently. Thank you very much for doing that, though. That was very kind of you. Sure. <laughs> Looks like there's another question from Dora Lee. Good morning. Could you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you for providing this program. And I just saw this um, registration on the technology uh, blind group. And I appreciate everything you do. And I had to run to the sauna and, and, and call you guys because you are so right. We could be everywhere and anywhere and call in and participate. But I do hope that they will come up with a Dora the Explorer avatar. I'm looking forward to that one. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a dog named Sarge, a service dog. So it'll be Dora the Explorer and Sarge in charge. So I'll, I'll look into that. And thank you for everything. And, and happy Friday, everyone. Thank you. That is sort of an advantage of uh, designing your avatar is that you can design it to look, you can design it to look like you or you can design it to look like whatever you want to. So uh, there's some sort of flexibility in that. Wonderful. Anyone else? How many people are gonna go out and get nice headsets? <laughs> <laughs> or speakers, right? Um... But I definitely could hear it very well. And um, there was a huge distinction when there was some, uh, when screen readers or, you know, announcements of people coming and going, which um, I think that would be very helpful. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, it works really well when you actually can hear what what it's supposed to be doing now john a real quick question so if we get our zoom in stereo would that make a difference no right so uh, I'm, okay I'm not, I'm not just bashing my competitor here but what what i was able to do is i can play stereo sound uh, that was part of my shared content and that stereo was communicated to you but you're not getting um uh, spatialized sound of different people speaking, I don't think. So it's not as if, you know, Lisa is showing up on the left and Beverly showing up on the right, which is what spatial sound design for video calling would do. Um, that is still, that, that requires more work than what's, what Zoom is doing. However, I will hand it to Zoom. They're doing stereo sound for shared content, which we don't have in Microsoft Teams yet. Um, so, so it just kind of shows the unevenness in which we're progressing in this space. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming today. And I know you're traveling and, um, we've been going month to month to see when you are available. And I look forward to working with your students again this year, if I have the opportunity and, um, Anytime yeah. you, you want to come back and you have some more research uh, to, to share or you have anything else you would like to share, we would love to have you come back. Well, well thanks for including me, Stacey, and for partnering. Um, Vista has partnered with Microsoft and with my class at Stanford uh, for years now, and I've really appreciated the access to people to give us feedback on uh, the research project that we do and give our students, you know, firsthand experience working with people who are blind in low vision and really understanding how to design for that population. Yeah, that's great. I remember a long time ago, you working on um, facial features, like uh, when people um, frown or right. roll their eyes, whatever happened to that research? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, we did share that with teams at the time. Um, they, they, didn't, they haven't productized that yet. Uh, I, I actually think that I, I will point out that was before pandemic. 
and a lot yes, of things yes. have gotten revisited since the pandemic and gotten more attention. And so that might be an issue, a program. You're the second person that reminded me of this in, in uh, this year. Uh, it might be something that we bring back to them, but right, we haven't haven't managed to get uh, the product team interested in that one yet. Yeah, I would like to know if somebody's rolling their eyes at me. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> and it to tell you. <laughs> yeah, they're rolling their eyes. <laughs> uh, uh, just to explain that project a little bit more, um, what we did was we associated certain musical sounds with certain recognized facial gestures. And the, the idea was to kind of do what happens in movie soundtracks, right? So you're watching the action and the music gets spookier and you kind of know that something is going on, but you can still understand the dialogue. It doesn't interfere with the dialogue. And so we were looking for these sort of soundtrack musical uh, signals of someone nodding their head in agreement or shaking their head in disagreement or kind of frowning or kind of being confused or especially like looking up as if when they're kind of looking for words to say. So to explain these sort of pauses or silences when you ask someone a question. And so we tried to integrate smoothly these sort of soundtrack music cues that would uh, not interfere with um, what was being said as well. Yeah, that would be a great feature to have on on Teams or Zoom or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll think about uh, asking them again about that. Great. Yes, uh, Miriam, you have another, you have your hand up? I do, and it's not a question. I just wanna say, I'll make sure I'm off. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm off yeah. of mute, okay. I just want to say this was absolutely fascinating today. I'm so thankful to you for sharing this with us. And uh, it'll be very interesting to um, see how this progresses, but greatly appreciated this today. Oh, thanks. I mean, it's encouraging and I love getting interaction with, you know, people who experience this every day and to give us feedback is this something that's interesting, you know, encourage us to keep pursuing uh some of the many technical yeah. problems to, to yeah. make this happen um so it's it, really yeah, valuable it, to get into it it hits close to home on many levels you know on many levels it right with the reality that we are going yeah. through yeah mm -hmm. so again thank you sure it's we should reach out to you for our december um technology conference that we have you may already know about it but um we have a he does yeah yeah <laughs> good yeah i wasn't able to join this past year but i have been able to participate in the past and and i definitely have uh i've been noticing the the folks that have been joining in which has been great that and i've sent my students some students to that as well yeah oh good excellent any other questions where it's we've got a few minutes left but we want if in interest of we have a little more time if if john does uh otherwise we can close this um oh so i will make sure i'll send to rob bob rob bob guy and and i hope it'll get to you lisa the yeah link to the demos that were shared um a link to describes how to do stereo audio and zoom and also, uh, oh, any an, an update on where Teams Avatars is in terms of the release product. product. So that can be shared as well. And I did give a link to the um, slides. Um, if people want to look at that as well. Wonderful. Well, thank Perfect. you so much, John, um, and thank you to everyone for joining. I think that was it was uh, wonderful. And again, our next. Uh, Check it out with Vista is going to be Friday, April 7th with Dragon Dictation, and that should also be great. So um, if you have any further questions and you, you you forgot after we sign off, you can send an email to Bob or Stacy or me, and we'll make sure that John gets that. Okay. So great. thank you again. Thank you, John. I'll take you off of the, <laughs> the spotlight. And yeah. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording.